there's a level of creation that happens when, frankly, again, no one gives a shit about the work that you do. Hi, my name is Damon Brown with DamonBrown.net. My main thing is helping you as a side hustler, solopreneur, otherwise a non-traditional entrepreneur. Today we're gonna to talk about Andre 3000, also known as Three Stacks, the one of the most well-known or at least the most respected rappers, half of the group Outkast, and one of the most eclectic and revered artists within the hip hop industry. I mean, this is a guy at this point who has had amazing seminal albums, um, solo and also with Big Boy as the group Outkast, and for at least a decade, decade and a half, has been on the solo journey where he's just, he's the equivalent of Jimi Hendrix at this point. He's like, I've had enough of the, the music industry. I'm gonna show up every, every other year, hop on someone's song, and it's gonna be the verse of the year, and I'm gonna disappear and spend time with my kid and wander around Atlanta <laughs> and live an artist's life. It's a beautiful thing. The seminal producer, Rick Rubin, was able to get him out of his cave and talk with him for his podcast called Broken Record. I recommend the whole conversation. I love it as a creator, as an artist. I grew up on Outkast. They're just a few years older than me, so I'm literally watching them grow up as I'm growing up. I've linked the whole thing in the description. It's about an hour and a half. It's worth your time. Three Stacks, Andre 3000 talks about him running into artists who were not going to create until they got a record deal. Let me repeat that. Andre 3000 talked about running into artists, artists like who are performing in a club or whatever, who are not going to record music until they got a record deal. You see my face. It's a chicken and an egg. People who are waiting to create, but aren't creating yet because they haven't been chosen, because they haven't been advocating for themselves, because they haven't said, I am worthy of this because they're waiting for permission. Shout out to my Bring Your Worth keynote. <laughs> I just did over at Benton Harbor. Shout out to Lake Michigan University or college. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate y'all. I talked about this just a few weeks ago over in Michigan, waiting for permission. So today we're gonna to talk about Andre 3000's wisdom when he talked about this, a little bit more about this background story and why you should not wait for permission and just get your stuff out there. Again, it's a Bring Your Work show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. If you're liking what you're hearing, be sure and subscribe. It is always free. If you like this episode in particular, be sure and like, throw a comment. I love comments. And share with other people who are on this particular journey that you're on or who people who need to hear this kind of stuff. So Andre 3000 was talking to Rick Rubin, legendary producer, co-founder of Def Jam. I won't even get into it, but he's a legend watched the movie Shangri-La, which gets into his history, as well as the, the famed building over in Malibu that his, his home slash recording studio is worth watching. It's over on Hulu, I believe. I'll throw a link in the notes. All right, so he's talking to him on his podcast called Broken Record. And Andre 3000 talks about being in a club, probably in Atlanta, which is where he's based, and an artist coming up to him and saying, hey, Andre, nice to meet you. And of course, he's like, nice to meet you too. Seems like a nice guy. And the artist was like, hey, um, I have stuff that I want to get out, but I don't have a record deal. Should I go ahead and wait before and not record anything until I get a record deal for it? I shouldn't put anything out. No mixtapes, no SoundCloud, nothing. Should I just wait? And Andrea 3000, of course, was like, hell no, you shouldn't wait. You should be creating the whole time. Not only creating, but getting your stuff out there. Now there's some logistical reasons for this. Because why is someone gonna give you a record deal if they haven't heard your music? Unless they happen to be in some random coffee club or jazz club or hip hop venue and you happen to get on stage and you know, it's like a star is born or some, some shit like that. That only happens, literally only happens in movies. I think Justin Bieber and maybe like a couple other people have had that happen. Who's the one that did a <clears throat> did the cover of, I think we're alone now? Tiffany, Tiffany, shout out to Tiffany. She was discovered in them all. Like, I can name these stories. Again, as I talk about in my Benton Harbor keynote, you can name the stories where people get picked, where people get permission to be of their full selves. Andre 3000 rightfully said, hell no. There's a few reasons for this. Number one, number one, before you get approval from the masses, 
that's your real proving ground. That's when you're creating your rawest material. There's a saying, I used to be a hip hop writer from Source and Double XL, New York Post even, I wrote about hip hop. And there's a saying within the hip hop industry in particular, but also in other music industries, is that the first album that an artist or a group does is seminal because that first album is for material of their whole life. The second album is only material <laughs> from the first album to the second album. And back in the day, they were turning out albums like crazy, you know, so it could be only enough material and new things that had happened in your life over the course of say nine months. That's often why we have the sophomore jinx because nothing new has happened. What, they were on the road supporting the first album? <laughs> were they gonna write about that? <laughs> Which they have in some cases. Outcast, ironically, is an, is, is an exception to the rule with their beautiful, beautiful album, AT Aliens. But I digress. Anyway, check it out. Thing is, is that you're able to create in your purest form because of that. In that period of time, it's so, so rare. With my first major book, it was called Porn and Pong, How Grand Theft Auto, Tomb Raider, and Other Sexy Games Changed Our, our Culture. And it came out in 2008, but it took me five years to write it which I was in my 20s going into my 30s at the time. It was a long ass time. <laughs> it would be a long time now, now that I'm much older to, uh, to be spending five years on a book. And I remember going through the struggle of finding the right agent, figure out my voice, kind of trying to eat, you know what I mean? Because I was still trying to make a living while I was moonlighting writing this book. And I remember a colleague saying, enjoy this time. And I was like, I don't know what you mean. I'm not enjoying it, I'm barely eating. I, I'm trying to find a good agent. No one's like understanding what I'm trying to do with this book, which is the history of video games and technology as well as intimacy, which will come out later with one, uh, a decade later when I was co-founder of the app Cuddler. So I found a lot of success with this, but this is like a decade before. And they said, no, this will be the only time where you'll be releasing a book. And essentially there's no expectations. There's no person saying you better have a bestseller. There's no criticism because no one knows who you are yet. There's a power in being invisible. I miss that sometimes. That's why like for uh, some of my books such as um, Bring Your Worth is a good example of it. No one knew I was working on it while I was working on it. So, you know, my um, kids were still relatively young. It was about three years ago. And I give them the sleep and then I would just work on the book because they were still at home before school. And I would just work on the book. And it wasn't until about the time, about the, time the book was going to the printing press that I started saying, okay, I have a book coming out. You, if you find success, or even if you find, you know, what you consider failure and heavy criticism, I've found both. So I'm, you'll survive both of them, trust me. And they're both just as heavy. No matter what the results are, when you get back into the proverbial studio, when you get back into, you know, your, your art, when you get back in creating, when you launch your next product, when you, you know, put out your next single, your next album, you're going to have to compete with the voices in your head. When I did The Bite Says Entrepreneur, it became a bestseller. And so when I came out with the product of Bite Says Entrepreneur shortly after, it was not a bestseller. So even though I was on the top 10 business books of all of Amazon, there was still pressure there when I had my next book. But I've had other books which a handful of books, I've done 26 books, a handful of them will be considered a financial failure. You know, some of them like have sold like literally, I can count the uh, number of copies that they sold on my hands. That felt the same. Cause then when I was going back up to bat, I still had that pressure that I didn't have before. If nobody knows who you are, your work, your create creations is it's at its purest. It will never be as pure. Number two, when you're not discovered yet, quote unquote, you find out who you are in the purest form. There's a level of creation that happens when, frankly, again, no one gives a shit about the work that you do. One of the reasons why I'm cursing during the show, that's because, again, as I've said in other episodes, I don't have CBS, ABC, Fox, NBC, Hulu, Netflix, whatever, telling me what I should be. Production manager or executive producer saying, oh, well, this is good for this audience or this is good for that audience. That's the beauty of it. 
in a sense, even though I have a nice amount of subscribers, thanks for y'all who have subscribed and a good amount of success, at least way more than I was expecting for this YouTube channel. Not only with this channel, but the impact of this channel and beyond to my keep my coaching career and all that stuff. I'm still relatively small. And there's a beauty in that. There might be one day when Brene Brown or actually some some of these people who are my friends who I won't even mention over here, they end up sharing some shit that's on here and I suddenly go viral. And maybe instead of having X amount of subscribers, I end up having millions of subscribers. The dynamic is gonna change. It just will. I'll do my best not to have it change and show up for you how I'm showing up for you. But there's no guarantee of that. But that's why I'm here. That's why I'm not doing another book right now. That's why, even though I've done keynotes, I'm not pushing the keynote game right now. That's why I'm not doing another startup. I've already done those before. I've already had a number one startup in the world with Cuddler several years ago. When I end up selling Cuddler with my co-founder, as I talk about my new book, Career Remix, I break it down to brass tacks, probably about as honest as I've been about it, where after we sold Cuddler, I was lost a little bit just because I felt as though I had to come up with another startup. But not only coming up with another startup, which in itself would be fine. Like, you know, I had the startup bug. I had already done two. Our second one was a success. Of course, I want to do another one. But I want to do another one and have as much acclaim as Cuddler did. That kind of pressure not only is unhealthy, but it's not conducive to creating. It's just not. So I know what it's like to go back up to the bat, even after you had a home run, even after you had a killer season, you got the <laughs> championship World Series. I'm not a baseball person, but you understand the analogy. That's a different type of energy. And so by my channel right now being quote unquote small, even though I had moments where I wanted it to be bigger, I also appreciate the DIY aesthetic of it. And then my camera's crooked sometimes and the light doesn't always work. I'm able to show up with you in this raw energy that if there were other people who had so-called picked me and said, Damon, do a show. Here's a bag. <laughs> bag means money. New slang. <laughs> do a show. Here's a bag. You're going to do the show like this. Then I wouldn't be showing up like this. I don't think I'd be as honest. And what Andre is saying is that your energy is the most potent when it is undiscovered. When you've discovered it, and when the people that support you have discovered it, that's your most potent power. When the mainstream or the gatekeepers, whatever term you want to use, the um, influencers discover your shit, by then, you are potentially in danger of losing your voice. So work as much as you can before you get discovered, quote unquote because you have this rare opportunity to discover your real voice. In fact, shout out to Miles. I think he said that it takes a long time to sound like yourself. That road can be a lot shorter if you embrace where you are before you hit it big. Anyway, just some wisdom from Andre 3000. Again, check out the whole interview. It's worth watching or listening to the Broken, Broken Record podcast with Rick Rubin. So thank you all for your wonderful content. It's a blessing. Again, the podcast was awesome. This is Bring Your Show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe. There's lots of content. Again, talking about side hustles, emotional intelligence when it comes to creating, um, creating something out of nothing, and all the stuff that we've talked about in this episode. Until next time, remember that you can bring your worth, and you can always go from now. Take care.